Good morning. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Good to see you guys. Good to see some familiar faces I haven't seen in a long time. I'm uh, on staff at Grace Point um, as the church planting apprentice, and I'm just glad to be here to be able to share the word with you. So today's message is going to be coming from the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verses 33 through 40, and the sermon title is called Clash of Kingdoms. So here now, uh, the reading of God's word. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. It's God's word and all God's people say. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this Memorial Day weekend where we remember those who have given their lives Uh, for our sake, and um, what more appropriate than to gather as your people and remember your son who um, was perfect and innocent and yet gave his life for us. Be with us this morning, Lord. Be with me as I um, deliver this word to your people, uh, that your spirit would lead and guide me, that your people would be blessed and encouraged um, by it. And so, Lord, we thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. And God blessed them. And he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over the living creatures that crawl upon the earth. The first command that God gives to his people is to build a kingdom. God gives Adam and Eve control over his whole creation. He says, you're king and queen of this land. Now go build. Make it beautiful. As people made in God's image, we're made to reflect his creativity in everything that we do. Now, the word creativity has kind of a narrow definition nowadays. It's often associated only with the arts. But everything that we participate in is creative on some level. So if you're a doctor, it requires creativity to integrate what you're hearing from your patient as they present symptoms and thinking through what you know from school to come up with a diagnosis or a treatment plan. If you're a teacher, you're getting asked questions by your students, and in that moment, you have to come up with creative ways of explaining and making a concept clear. If you're a parent, you have to be creative in how to engage your child's heart and mind. The problem with being made to be kings and queens is that God intended us to be representative kings and queens of his ultimate rule. We're supposed to honor him and reflect him in all that we do. But since our first parents created a kingdom for themselves, a kingdom for themselves and opposed to his, we've been following their lead. And so the question for us this morning to wrestle with is what kind of kingdom are you building right now? Who's the king that rules over your kingdom? What defines the goals of your days? Because you see, there's really only two choices. We're either subjects serving the king, Jesus, or we're building and participating in the kingdoms of this world. So do you wake up each morning a servant of King Jesus, or do you wake up something like this? Whoa, whoa, whoa. 
人だ。おらら、おおいわ。金銀だけはそう、金銀だけはそう。Have a chair, I have a chair. Go do this, go do this. King in the castle. Now, I love that clip, and, and I'm glad it made most of you laugh.、Um, but I think if we actually boil it down where our hearts are most of the time, we actually think a lot like Borat. We're kings of our castles. So this morning, the passage comes at the end of the Gospel of John. And what has just happened prior to this event is Jesus has spent a night with his disciples, and they've had a meal, and he's prayed for them, he's prayed for their future. And then immediately Judas has betrayed him. He's been arrested and tried before the high priest and found guilty of blasphemy. And this is the first time he's being brought by the religious leaders to the governor of Judea. And so I just want to look at three things from this text one, that Jesus' kingdom is not of this world, two, that his subjects are not of this world, and three, that、um, Jesus rules over a kingdom of truth. So, first, kingdom not of this world. So the passage begins with a meeting. And this is a significant meeting because this is the first time in Jesus' entire ministry where he's actually interacting with the political power of his day. We've seen throughout the Gospels all of his confrontations with religious leaders, but here Jesus is in front of the governor. And what we need to see here is that while Pilate isn't Caesar, he's definitely the representative of his kingdom in Judea. And so we have a clash of two kings and two kingdoms. And what we learn right off the bat is that the two kingdoms are not the same. As, as governor, Pilate would have been in charge of about 3,000 uh, 3, soldiers in the immediate area. And he would have been in charge of the taxes collected. He would have appointed the high priest. And here Jesus has brought before him the Messiah, the king of the Jews. And as Pilate asks him if he's a king, Jesus' response is striking. Look at what he says in verse 36. He says, My kingdom is not of this world. So, the first thing we need to see is that Jesus does not deny being a king, but he wants to clarify that Pilate's way of seeing things is not the way that God sees things. Historians and archaeologists have discovered that Pilate was a pretty cruel leader. And when the aqueducts were aging and there was a lack of money to pay for them, he actually stole money from the temple treasury to pay for their reparation. And,、um, So, for Pilate, the kingdom is about Caesar. It's about controlling a portion of land. It's about armies that one commands and the destruction of enemies. It means wealth and influence and palaces and servants. It means establishing peace and preserving order. And when we see that this is the way Pilate sees the kingdom, we see the contrast. The first and probably most significant difference is that Pilate sees a kingdom run by man. While Jesus is stating that he's the ruler of a kingdom that's run by God. And while Pilate rules a small portion of an empire run by Caesar, governed by a senate and maintained by soldiers, Jesus rules over a creation and a kingdom that's established and maintained by the Holy Spirit. Just as in Genesis 1, the Holy Spirit is present at the creation of the world, the Spirit is the one to order and complete and maintain the kingdom. That Jesus is over. In addition, the kingdom that Jesus rules over is cosmic in its scope. Pilate is thinking about Europe, he's thinking about northern Africa and small parts of the Middle East. When Jesus says his kingdom, he is speaking about the whole earth, the sun, the star, every moon, every planet in our solar system, every solar system. For Jesus, the kingdom includes places and things that Pilate can't begin to comprehend because no eye has seen and no ear has heard of these things. For Pilate, power meant having an army to execute battle maneuvers. For Jesus, power means that by speaking, he can bring things into being. For Pilate, enemies were foreign nations. For Jesus, enemies are supernatural the devil, fallen angels. And all those opposed to God. For Pilate, a kingdom involved preserving the health of the people. For Jesus, his kingdom has no sickness, no death, no war. And just as that was a radical thought for Pilate at that time to wrap his head around, it remains so today because we live in a time where we're caught between two periods in history. 
For when Jesus was forgiving sins and healing the sick and raising people from the dead, he was ushering in the kingdom of God and showing us what the world looks like when God is made visible. But at the same time, God in his wisdom has allowed opposing kingdoms to remain until Jesus comes again. And so as people living on that weird side of history where Jesus has come, he's been raised from the dead, we live in a world with tension. We live in a world where we often forget which kingdom we belong to. For our mindset has to be that we're destined to be in the kingdom of God. But throughout the week, we become and live primarily for these smaller kingdoms that we're building for ourselves. So what kind of kingdom defines how you live your life? Is it the kingdom of comfort? The life that's ruled by your pleasure and having your needs met? Is it a kingdom without discomfort where you do everything in your power to avoid pain and suffering? Is it one of control where you don't want to let anything happen that falls out of what you're able to deal with? Is it a kingdom that requires a bigger house or a certain title in your job or a specific car or television? If we're honest, we fall prey to rival kingdoms every day. And for people like me in ministry, those um, temptations can even be more insidious. How easy is it for me to confuse a kingdom that I'm building for myself with the actual kingdom of God? How easy is it for me to be tempted into thinking that something I'm doing is actually advancing God's work when only Jesus can do that? Ministers can be tempted to arrogance when things are going well and despair when things are not going well. But the reason for both of those types of reactions are the same. We're confusing our kingdoms with the true one. And what we see in the text this morning is that every kingdom opposed to Jesus's has a time limit. Jesus speaks of a kingdom that has no beginning and no end. For us today, do we long to see that never-ending kingdom established on earth? Do we give in to the temptation to place all of our hope in relative power? Or do we trust in the power of God? You may be thinking, so what does that mean? Am I supposed to not care about the way things are right now? Am I not supposed to care about injustices that I see every day? Am I to sit back and let things get worse? And I'm saying no. But I'm saying you can't even begin to engage the world in the right way unless you start with the mindset that you're a citizen of heaven. Unless you know that you're a member of the kingdom of Jesus, you can't engage the kingdoms of this world with the right mindset or the right expectations. Because if you think of the U.S. as the true kingdom, you could only be disappointed by the brokenness of our political system. You might be saying to yourself, well, that might be the case, but I know things would be better if somebody else was running things right now. And my response is even better is not the kingdom of God. No president can usher in the kingdom, the place that we long to see fully realized on earth as it is in heaven. And when we recognize that the real need is gospel transformation, it's then that we'll have the right mindset and be able to engage. If you read the news, if you're frustrated by worldwide what is going on right now, you need to have perspective and just take a moment to even look at high moments in our nation's history. Think about the civil rights movement. You had Protestants and Catholics, Muslims and Christians, men and women, atheists, coming together for something they believed in and real change happened. Laws changed. Things are actually better than they were. But have we fixed the race problem in this country? Do you really believe that the right laws, the right leaders, the right police officers will fix the problem? A couple of weeks ago, NBC had a documentary called Let It Fall, and it followed the race riots in L.A. 25 years ago. And I was watching it thinking, man, a lot has happened in 25 years. I think technologically, right, people have Apple watches. We have high-definition televisions. We've had a black president. But, man, race looks the same. Why? Because the problem isn't laws, the problem isn't leadership, the problem is our hearts. The problem is building and trusting in a kingdom that's not God's. 
We have an example in Scripture of how to properly engage when we look at Paul. No one was a more zealous preacher of the gospel than Paul, right? For him to live was Christ, to die is gain. And yet he wrote to the church in Rome that they were to obey the leaders. And the leader was Nero, the man who ultimately killed him. The fiercest opponent to Christianity, the man who slaughtered Christians. But Paul was the one who regularly confronted those leaders, preaching the gospel to them, praying for their salvation. He held that tension of confronting the powers that be, but placing his ultimate trust in Christ. We need to be engaged, but we need to know that the ultimate change that needs to happen is heart change. Paul knew that if Nero's heart changed, things would really change. So we see first from this text that Jesus' kingdom is not a kingdom of this world. And the next thing we need to see is that his subjects are not of this world. Verse 36 says, If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. Now, it makes sense if Jesus says his kingdom is not of this world, then the people that are a part of it are not of this world. But we need to understand the direct context in which he's speaking this. Prior to this moment, Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends, has denied knowing him in the courtyards. Jesus is in front of the high priest. He's being questioned and Somebody spots Peter warming his hands by the fire and says, I I think you know this guy, Jesus. And Peter's like, no, I don't know him. He denies him three times. So when Jesus is saying this, he's saying right here in this moment in time, my followers are not of this world because if they were, they would be coming to my aid. But on another level, he's speaking of the experience his followers would have after he died and was resurrected. Like I said, prior to this, he's had this meal and he's prayed for his disciples. And he says this to them. He says, know that the world has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But you are not of the world. But I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. These are sobering words from Jesus. He's saying that those of you who will follow me will be hated just as I'm hated. And while that might not be our daily experience here, we're living like people who wander in the desert. We're not home yet, and we shouldn't be surprised if we often feel out of place. This text provides those of us with comfort who experience that weekly, daily, monthly feeling that things are just not right and they don't feel like you're really a part of the people around you because we live in a world that's not obedient to God's law. And Jesus is saying, you shouldn't be surprised when things aren't the way they're supposed to be. In January, a friend of mine uh, and I went to go get a drink uh, one evening in, uh, in Philly. And as we were crossing the street, a car hit us and left. And my friend suffered significant brain injury. He, I, I took, just got clipped. He went down hard. And that night, the people that hit us left The cops never showed up, and the ambulance took us to the wrong hospital, not the one that his wife worked at. They took us somewhere else. And then in the trauma unit, as he's bleeding, they left him alone. So I was running out saying, I don't think my friend's doing well. He's coughing. He's coughing up blood. This text, I need texts like this to remind me that what I experienced that night should be the norm. It's abnormal when things actually go well because we're living in a time where these two kingdoms are clashing. And Jesus is saying, don't be surprised when things are a mess. Don't be surprised. But this text doesn't only comfort us, it confronts us as well. Because we live in the midst of rival kingdoms. And some of us might not feel that different from the people around us. So as we're comforted, we're also confronted to ask whether or not we live as people that have been resurrected from the dead. Paul says it like this in one of his letters, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of power of the air, the spirit now at work in the sons of disobedience. As you live in this world, are you aware of the ways that you're tempted 
to live just like you're living for yourself? Do you recognize sin in your life? Do you see that there are things in your life that are not the way they're supposed to be? Because as people filled with the Holy Spirit, we should feel that tension daily in our lives. We should feel sad and disturbed by our sins. As spirit-filled people, we've been made new. So what does that mean for us today? It means that while we live day-to-day in this world, we're actually strangers in a strange land. The world doesn't operate, and the people do not operate with the same mindset as those who love God. But because Jesus' kingdom has not fully arrived yet, we're constantly struggling in our own lives with where our allegiance lies. So Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. His followers are not of this world. And the last thing this text confronts us with is Jesus' kingdom is a kingdom of truth. So as these two kings meet and discuss their kingdoms, we see a confrontation about the nature of reality taking place. For when Jesus says his kingdom is not of this world, Pilate understands that Jesus is affirming that he's a king. Listen to their conversation. Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? Now, what Jesus says here is the culmination of the entire gospel of John. And one scholar noted that if you read the gospel of John from beginning to end, it's like a court transcript where witness after witness is coming forth and testifying to the truth. And by the end, the reader is confronted with the question, who do you believe and what do you believe? As I read through the gospel, just giving you highlights, listen, John 1, the first chapter, John the Baptist comes as a witness to provide a testimony. He testified that Jesus was the Son of God. Andrew and Nathaniel, the first to meet Jesus, testify that he's the Messiah. John 3, John bears witness to what he has seen and heard. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well, right? And then she goes home, and it says, Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. John 10, the works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. So we see here, just as we've seen throughout the gospel, that Jesus is making a truth claim. He's saying that he's come to testify to the truth, and Pilate's response is a question, what is truth? And in responding this way, Pilate is thinking about truth in the context of being the authority and the power in Jerusalem. For Pilate, in this context, Pilate is truth. Pilate was governing the land. Pilate would have had the power to appoint the high priest. Pilate would have been in control of the military. So to hear Jesus say that he's coming to testify to the truth is ridiculous for Pilate to hear. Because in the day-to-day life in Judea, Pilate is truth. So we need to see Pilate's question as a rhetorical one. And the answer that Pilate is implying is, I am the truth here. And we know this is the case because if you read on in the same chapter, after Pilate has Jesus beaten and he attempts to release him, the crowd demands that Jesus be killed. And Pilate demands that Jesus answers him. And he says, do you not know I have the authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Pilate, as the one in authority, believes he's the arbiter of truth, the one who could decide what Jesus' fate is, the one who's in control. But Jesus is saying, your power is relative to mine. Yours has been given to you by my Father. Mine is eternal and unchanging. One commentator said it like this, Pilate thinks he's the one questioning Jesus, but Pilate is on trial, and Jesus is the judge. So we see, again, these two opposing kingdoms, the kingdom of absolute truth, and the kingdom of relative truth that Pilate rules over. And Pilate, as well as us, are being asked to make a decision. Do we believe Jesus, or do we believe Pilate? For Pilate, truth is self-determined. Jesus is saying he alone determines what's true. 
You hear Jesus saying that the only way to know what is true is to listen and follow his words. It's only in Jesus that we know what is real. You know, truth today has become a much stickier issue than it would have been in Jesus' time. In Jesus' time, there was a belief in absolute truth. But when we see Pilate speak the way that he does in this passage, we realize that the modern idea that truth is relative, that we can create truth, is not so modern because Pilate had the same mindset that many of us have today. We say today, well, no one can really know the whole story. There are many truths. We can't determine which one um, is true. We can determine the ones that fit with our lifestyle. And we've seen more than any other time in history the monster that we've created with relative truths because now we live in a world with alternative facts. There are no alternative facts. There's truth and there's untruth. But because we believe we can determine what is true, something that can never be relative, we've made relative. So there are at least three things we need to think about when we have that mindset. And the first is our language. One of the things that separates us from other animals is that we have creative language. But what's fascinating about our language is that we can't avoid speaking in truth claims. Even if you say there's no such thing as absolute truth, you're actually making an absolute truth claim. Why is that? The second thing that's interesting is we're actually fascinated by truth. So last year, a big show, I didn't watch it, but a big show won tons of awards was The People versus O.J. Simpson. And the way that they marketed that show was you will hear things and see things that actually happened that never made it on the news. And people were gripped. They wanted to see what they had not covered on the national news. The truth is fascinating to us. The last thing that's funny or not so funny is that the truth isn't changing. So we can spend our whole lives denying the truth, but if it's true, it's not going anywhere. So my daughter, Merwin, is in this pretend play stage. It's amazing. Uh, she sees things that we don't see. She plays with things that aren't really there. She cooks whole meals for us. And uh, I was saying in the first service, she's been playing with a cat for the past week. And as somebody that's deathly allergic to cats, I'm kind of wondering what she's trying to tell her dad, that everywhere we go, she has her cat with her. But one of the things she hates getting done in the morning before she goes to daycare is her hair done. She hates Courtney pulling on her hair. And she cries and she, she runs away. But then at night, when I'm sitting in our living room watching television, she comes up behind me and she says, Daddy, I'm going to brush your hair. And immediately, she takes a like, bristly brush and rakes it over my bald scalp. And it hurts, and it leaves marks. And I, and I grab it, and I say, Daddy doesn't have hair. And she says, yes, you do. And she does it again. Now, as much as I wish Merwin's pretend play was based in some form of reality, the truth is I don't have anything on my head. And nothing will change that. The truth doesn't change. So you might be saying, well, those are all interesting points, but look at the world we live in. We can't trust the news. The papers have their own agenda. The truth is distorted. The Bible was written thousands of years ago. How can I trust it? And those are good questions. But the question about God and his word is very different from the question of trusting the news. We're not talking about a corrupt reporter or a bad professor. We're talking about an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God. And if he's created us, don't you think he's capable of communicating the truth to us? And if God gives us the truth, then that has to be the measuring rod for which we understand everything else. And so what's the truth that today's passage is confronting us with? Well, Jesus is confronting us with what is true and what is not. And he's saying that the kingdoms we currently see ruling over us will not be the ones standing when he returns. When Jesus returns, the kingdom of God will be fully established. There will be no more sickness, no more death, no more war, no more hunger. He's saying that though his followers may suffer now, will one day rejoice when all things are renewed and made right. 
And he's saying the only way to get there is through him. We can't get there by moving up the professional ladder. We can't get there by having a spouse and two kids in a nice home. We can't get there by being good people or by trying really hard to do the right thing. We can't get there by getting that dream job and saving a lot of money for those rainy days. We create those kingdoms because we believe the promises they make to us. You'll be important. You'll be loved. You'll be complete. But if you read the biographies of some of the greatest kingdom builders in history, you'll find a very different story, marked often by heartbreak and frustration and loneliness. The false belief that one more building, that one more paycheck will satisfy that desire for security, for peace. When we believe that the kingdoms we create for ourselves are what we need most, we look just like Borat in that video. The kingdoms we create will never last the test of time, and they'll never satisfy the longings of our heart. What we need is to be a part of the kingdom that lasts forever, the one ruled by the one who made it all, the one who created every good thing, the one who knows us deeply, who knows our weaknesses, who knows our strengths, who knows our sins, and says, I'm willing to die for you because I love you more than anything. We need to be embraced by the true king and welcomed into the true kingdom. And Jesus is saying the only way to get there is to put your faith in him. The only way to get there is realizing you can't get there by your own strength. The only way to get there is to realize you're a sinner that deserves punishment, but that in Christ on the cross, that sin has been paid for. We want a kingdom that seizes control right now, that makes things right immediately. We want a king that wipes out our enemies. But Jesus says, no, the kind of king I am is the king that will suffer the punishment that you deserve. The type of king I am is the one who will die to save you, my royal subjects. The kingdom I bring is not one defined by war and worldly power. It's a kingdom of peace and truth defined by weakness. And you can trust this king because right now, as we gather here this morning, he's interceding for us beside the Father. Because our king suffered for us, we suffer now too. We live in a world opposed to the true king. We live in a world that chooses Barabbas. Don't choose the counterfeit. Choose Jesus. Because it's in choosing Jesus that you'll have the hope that you need and the strength to actually engage in the world right now in the way that believers can engage. It's with that heavenly mind. It's with knowing that your place is secure in heaven. It's in knowing that nothing can take away the love of God for you, that you could actually see things the way they need to be and you could do it and engage it in the right way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for texts like this this morning. We wake up each morning hearing about things happening all across the world that break our hearts. And we ask, what is going on? And yet here we see that you remain on your throne and that you promise to bring a kingdom that will last forever. We confess that as we leave this place, as we get into our cars this afternoon, we're going to immediately be pulled to long for the kingdoms of this world. The quick answer, the quick, the thing that will satisfy us right now. And yet, Lord, you chose the difficult path. You chose the one that didn't lead to immediate joy. It led to suffering. It led your son to the cross. Help us, Lord, to have that long perspective. Help us to trust in your plan for us. Help us to love even when it hurts. We love you and we thank you for all that you've done for us in Jesus' name.